the channel today discussing sport, society, and a topic that's been growing quite a bit in popularity over the past few years, sports betting integrity. I'm joined here, you know, with Dr. Brett and Bobby, Jennifer Roberts, Do we have the mic? and Grady Bell. <laughs> first, first time on it. <laughs> so I, I've been involved in sports betting for about six years ago on the operator side. And so this is a topic that's uh, passionate to me. I'm very passionate about it. And like, as, as I mentioned, this is a topic, sports betting and that I'm growing quite a bit in popularity to this summer. The recent issue, what we'll call that, which we're going to talk about uh, in this panel. The first thing I'd like to do is actually introduce the panel here a little bit. Let's start with Brett. So, Brett, can you describe some of the work that the International Gaming Institute does? And specifically, what are some of the goals of the IGI? And how does that vision for the IGI do research and education? And finally, what role does the IGI play relative to this point? I'd answer the first and last of those questions. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for sticking around for what I believe is the last session of the day uh, and the session of the day. Uh, I'm Brett Bartell. I'm the uh, executive director of the International Gaming Institute here at UNLV. And our remit is anything that falls underneath the gambling umbrella. Everything we can call on gambling in addition. We run with a lot of problem gambling projects, which uh, follows individuals as they move through the treatment process to ensure that. Adequate resources are allocated for treatment and harm prevention needs, all the way up to things like operative food analysis, macro socioeconomic impacts for new jurisdictions that are thinking about bringing gambling to their shores. And within that, of course, then is sports betting. It's something that we've studied and worked in for decades, plural. Our institute actually celebrated its 30th anniversary this year. Very exciting. Uh, and and as, as as Joanne will talk about in a moment, when Casco was overturned in the Supreme Court in 2018, clearly this became a subject that was all the more relevant to what we study. So we have been looking into this space and thinking about how gambling intersects with sporting and competition activity, and uh, that's been going on now for uh, many years. Okay. I'm Beth Roberts, who served as Vice President and General Counsel at WinBet. It's been a very interesting career journey. I've mean, known each other about eight years now. We've had a few uh, few stops along the way with your career path. And I wonder if you could talk about some of those and your involvement in sports training. Sure. Um, I actually kind of have the luck of being able to experience uh, sports betting from all different angles within the legal field. Meaning, uh, I've been outside counsel with sports betting companies. I have been uh, currently in house counsel to a sports betting company. I have been a regulator briefly with the Tennessee Lottery when they were um, just first legalized sports betting regulation. And I've been in academia with the International Center for Gaming Regulation. And I teach sports betting law um, at UNLV. So um, I've, I've seen it from all varieties of uh, angles here in the legal field and uh, really enjoyed working in the sports betting, especially because Nevada was, you know, the first state to have legalized sports betting for many years. So we have much experience in this arena that we could rely on that could go to other states and expand where we're at over 35 states with legal uh, regulated sports betting now. So, um, yeah, that's the question. <laughs> Last but not least, Grady, Grady Felt uh, from the Nevada Gaming Control Board. First, can you share with some of us the role of the Nevada Gaming Control Board and then your personal role in your journey to this point? Certainly. The, the Gaming Control Board basically we're supposed to protect a few things state revenue and the people that come here to play. That's the biggest role is to protect both sides. Everybody in the fair shape. Uh, which is the state that the revenue is supposed to get. If everyone follows the rules, they're supposed to go. That's what are supposed to go by the regulation. As long as that's in place, everybody's happy at the end of the day. People leave this state daily losing thousands of dollars, the happiest can be. <laughs> I don't know how that is. <laughs> so the Game Control Board, we're, we're here to regulate the people who have the license, 
the people who are trying to get the license, people playing the games, and, and also the enforcement side, the criminal side. And that's where most of my experience in the last 17 years since I came to the board has been in uh, illegal bookmaking and, and crimes related to sports betting uh, across the country. It's a the bookmaking world is a very small world, even though it's, uh, it's worldwide. The players involved, are, it's not like a huge amount. It's, it's a small circle, uh, legal and illegal, very small circle. And, and those people um, have had the opportunity now to expand their business to all these states uh, in a legal fashion. And that, that's interesting to see how the states come to Nevada, as Jennifer said, and try to learn a little bit, or if they go off on their own and try to wing it, and what the end results are those cases. I think that really dovetails into, into the first question, first topic, which is just Nevada in general. I mean, we know that Nevada has a long history with gambling and sports betting as well. From each your perspective, what is the impact of sports betting been on the community of Southern Nevada? Uh, my, okay. So my perspective is from law enforcement side of things. And in sports betting here in the community, and obviously now we have all these new sports, all the leagues are coming into town, everybody's thrilled with that, all the money. So it's, it's generating a lot of money, revenue for the state, for the city, for the area. With that comes the criminal element who comes with every other gambling game. How can I beat this? How can I make more money than I'm supposed to add it? What can I do to scam someone else out of their money to move myself forward? So the community as a whole, most people who live in Las Vegas who don't come down the strip, they probably don't see the effect as much. Maybe they see the Knights, hopefully they're going to see the A's soon, or the Raiders football, and the revenue that that generates. But they don't see the underlying effects of the criminal element that comes along with all that other factors. Anybody else want to add anything to that? Or? So the idea of placing a wager of any kind of value, money, time, any other item of value that you might have, that I I joke about pinky, but I think you didn't understand in the history of that small there. That might also be a relevant item of value. And the ties of this activity to some form of sporting competition, the idea that we've been spectating competition for millennia, have always been inextricably linked. If we think back more broadly to gambling, anybody heard the phrase roll the bones with regard to tossing some dice? That goes back to the days when we would literally roll bones, shoot bones, go bones, that they were knuckle bones that were used to tell fortunes. And that then came into what we now know as modern day dice. Uh, one of my favorite cocktail party facts to share, for example, and this would be a very fun one, Nancy, you can't answer it because I've done this to you. Uh, why do dice have pips on them instead of Arabic numerals? Dots, yes. why, did, why did dice have dots? <laughs> easier to make. Easier to make. Anyone else? If this isn't like a shame moment, right? Because <laughs> answers are answers, right? Pretty. It's because, uh, sorry. It's, um, it's prettier. It looks better than a one. Oh, it, it is prettier. Isn't it? Well, I agree with that. <laughs> you can, you can so, feel it like a, it, it's like braille kind of, yeah. So that we all, I think, are true. <laughs> But the original reason, how's that, as to why dice have the dots instead of the vehicles, is that dice are older than the Arabic uh, numbering system. That's how long we've been taking chances as humankind. We are by nature risk takers. Some of us are more risk averse than others, but we are by nature risk takers, and oftentimes that manifests in the form of gambling. When we think about this in terms of sport, then this goes back again. Hundreds of years, millennia. Um, does anybody play or enjoy lacrosse, for example? Or would you put their hand on this question? Um, the, the early days of lacrosse in tribal nations in North America 
used to bring valuable goods to the gate and they would tie all their goods together. Wagers would be tied together with a rope. And as these, as bigger and bigger tribes would come together for lacrosse matches, they would tie together these wagers. And you'd have a spectacular, ostentatious display of wealth next to the gate that the winning team would then just grab the rope in the middle and drag away their wagers with them as they left. Uh, think about okay. Hopefully, we'll get some more hands here. Um, who who uh, enjoys cricket, maybe and uh, golf? We should get some more hands. Excellent. <laughs> some of the very first rules for these games were written to settle betting disputes because people were betting on the game they were playing, and there were no no formal rules for these games that would help settle any sort of argument. And then they have duels, and people would kill each other, and clearly that's a terrible thing. <laughs> and, and so, as sport in the general, so too did this chance and risk that is associated with it. As this goes on, clearly not everything was some kind of waste, which is why we have enforcement divisions like the one that we're in with supervisor now. And so, all of this plays into this broader impact on how sport exists within society, within community. Because often, when these wagers were originally made, they were made with other members of the society of the community. And then, as that grew further, now I promise we're getting to present day because the question was about Southern California. Clearly, this has been something that's been incredible. Nevada, I just came back from Southern So, within Southern Nevada, then climate change has been incredibly important. Um, I mean, this is the Silver State, but mining has been long eclipsed by gambling and water entertainment. If you're staying at any of these resorts, you'll see that there's tons of other product mix involved. And then with this sport, clearly we're bringing sport to Nevada. For a very long time, there were a lot of concerns that many of the negative impacts of gambling that are often associated with the activity would completely corrupt sport. And it was kept out of the city, it was kept out of the state. And now, clearly, um, since we're in the middle of the spin, we've had time and things are going great so far. <laughs> we have an incredible amount of success on this. And that has meant an ongoing review of what it means to have sport in the middle of a gambling society that is Southern Nevada. Okay. I think that what Nevada has done for for the sports betting and, and you said the importance of sports betting to Nevada. Um, interestingly, what I think a lot of people don't understand about sports betting, it's not a money maker for the operators. It it really isn't. Um, and you know, unfortunately, with the expansion of gambling across the United States. A lot of um, proponents of, of sports betting were, you know, talk about how much money comes in, in, in the sports betting industry. And that's that's accurate. People do enjoy wagering on sports. People do like to place um, wagers on the Golden Knights. And you're going to see a lot of, you know, regional bias on your local teams um, when it comes to sports betting. But what people don't understand is that um, you know, just because a lot of money is wagered on sports doesn't mean that the operators in the state get a lot of benefit from it. In fact, a lot of money is paid out back to the people that wager on sports. So it's it's not a friendly game to operators. And in fact, if you ask a lot of casinos, they're going to say, I, you know, I don't really care for my sports book because it doesn't make me a lot of money. Um, it doesn't make a lot of money. When it comes, you know, because it's not most sports books are not 24-7, you know, so it's not a lot of empty space that they'd probably rather see um, you know, with slot machines or table games that what will bring a lot more revenue. Hmm. Um, but what it does is that it kind of like just what sports does, it brings people together, it brings people to the casino to watch games, to engage in in observing sports and you know watching the team that they maybe place a wager on. So that's why you see it, because if one casino doesn't have it, they're losing out people that would go to a sports book. So everyone has it, even though it doesn't really bring uh, much revenue to the state of Nevada. Right, and as a general rule of thumb, you always see 2%, so approximately the overall gaming revenue that's attributed to sports betting. 
And it's really interesting when you think about how just a couple of years ago, I felt like none of the leagues, none of the teams wanted to come here. And you know, now they now we, they we can't they can't come here fast enough. And you can't help but wonder how much of that can be attributed to proliferation of sports betting throughout the country. And so with that, what are some areas of concern in your mind? When or areas of concern in Auckland with new with states that are new to sports betting, or what they should be most aware? No, another one. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, every game that's ever been played, someone's looking to take advantage of that. How can I get an edge on everybody else? How can I make my team get some money? The sharpest betters, people who are very good at it, work very hard at it. They put a lot of time and effort into it. They dig for information and they make wise decisions. They don't uh, share that. So big concern, and what the states don't recognize, and, and I'm not sure where everybody's from, but there's there's levels now of people who will tell you uh, how much money you can make in sports betting, how much you will win if you buy their picks. I can sell you my pick. I win 85% of the time. That's a lot. Anyone tell you they win more than 54, 55%? It's probably lying. I'm really tempted to put this microphone on you. That's my Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> so tout is the word that he used. And, and a lot of people don't know what a tout is, but it's growing across the country. I've seen it since the week after this past. People selling their picks. Um, I'll have Jennifer call me and I'll sell her my pick for the day. I'll have Brent call me and I'll give her the opposite side. One of them's gonna win, one's gonna lose. One's gonna be a happy customer, one's gonna think, oh, maybe it was just a bad pick. But as soon as I hang up with that first conversation, my salespeople are gonna call them. And they're going to say, you know, that was just a one-time pick. You should pick a, a week. You should buy a week package for fifteen hundred dollars. And or you could buy the season for twenty-five thousand dollars. And these people have no knowledge, no skill, other than being a sales. So these new states that come in, this is just one example of the ideas behind sports betting that the states, they don't even know it exists yet. So they have someone coming to their sports book and says, hey, I bought a package from this guy and, and the, the licensee's not gonna have a, an idea of who that person is, who they're tied into, or what level of knowledge they have. We get complaints all the time. Uh, do we have some financial folks in here who would uh, invest money? If someone comes to you with and says, if you invest 10,000, I'll give you 100,000 next week, that's not a really good idea. Because <laughs> <laughs> right? most of the types of things that we see in the sports betting world mm -hmm. uh, on a regular basis now, people trying to convince people they're better than everybody else in what they do. That, that's one of the major problems that I see. Yeah, and you see the, a lot of the pops in. Kind of the influencer space on social media and a lot of times they're in front of their Lamborghinis and Bugattis and, and the idea is that they they acquired those through their knowledge in sports but but, but again I, I digress. Mm. Uh, right here. Yes. I hope there's an opportunities question that follows this one because we're about to get a real down of oh, here, <laughs> here for it. Not to be concerned as athlete abuse. Uh, one of the biggest things that, that comes out of the more open sports betting world is, and, and it's not just sports betting too, it's, it's sort of the digital world that we live in, the access to individuals that we didn't have, say, 10 years ago. Uh, and the idea that there's now abusive athletes following the games. You, uh, you dropped that touchdown and so I didn't cover the spread. Or uh, clearly you threw the game because you didn't play optimally. Well, maybe somebody just had a cold, right? Uh, and, and this though, it's ongoing. You lost me $5,000. It's very direct and very harsh, very quick. And we don't really have good mechanisms in place, particularly in North America as a whole, for protection and or prevention on this sort of thing. It's not necessarily something that would come from, say, again, the regulatory authority because it doesn't fall under their remit. It might be something that a sports organization might need to consider, 
but it might not be something they thought of. But it is a very big problem. It's been covered now a couple of times in major media outlets. Um, I've seen this in Washington Post, it's shown up in the Times, but it still seems to be somewhat limited to sports focused media, sports, sports focused discussions. And uh, of course, the athletes who are the recipients of this kind of abuse uh, talk about it on their own social media platforms. And this is something that, that's ongoing. It's not something that's new to North America. It's absolutely something that has existed in other parts of the world before. But we're still not even in a place there where there may or may not be adequate protection of athletes for this sort of thing. And I think a lot of that stems from things that go beyond the scope of gambling and go beyond the scope of sport into accessibility that we have these days in a digital setting. Uh, I have a few more, but I hope I'm so oh, I know, actually, I, I think that's actually a great, yeah. a great. You see those, those those instances where you might have gamblers that are actually sending direct messages to people through their social media platforms. I know there have been some instances of that, which have been um, thankfully shut down. If I could add on to that, the, 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 the now the NIL jumps on the board, mm. and I'm not sure who's properly vetting the local businessman who is yeah. who's paying this person to do an advertisement or whatever it might be. So that, that throws another level of, of uh, integrity issue questions as to, you know, okay, so you missed that free throw. Who, what was his, what was your your sponsor, I'll call it sponsor, what was his take on that game? What was, did he have money? Is he a gambler? Isn't he a gambler? So Sorry. Just throwing that into the mix makes it, just 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 quickly for an international audience can you explain the nil to the group <laughs> quickly uh name image, image and likeness uh, athletes high school and college athletes can now be compensated for there's three or four things um uh, that they can do they can they can do advertising for car dealership um, but when they do these type of things it has to be a fair market value uh, that they're getting paid. They can't get paid fifty thousand dollars to do a five minute piece or something. They can't go to uh, like a conference like this and get a hundred thousand dollars to come in and talk to you for ten minutes. It has to be fair market value. There's three or four other things specifically that they can do uh, that they get paid for, but that has put a whole new level of of concern. Uh, and I, the NCAA. This is probably an editorial. <laughs> the resources are not as big as the issues, if that makes sense. So uh, two sidebars real quick. Um, if you're interested in this kind of area, as uh, Craig was mentioning, uh, there's a great uh, 60 minutes interview of Billy Walters who is a professional sharp, he's like the most well-known sharp sports better. And he kind of goes through what his system is um, as far as wagering on sports. And um, it's really fascinating because he is, his um, winnings are roughly 51% and he's known as the best in the industry. So that just kind of goes to your point. Um, the second um, is, you know, Unfortunately, there are some laws that will help enforce the, the threats against athletes, but usually it becomes, it gets to the point where they're making death threats and uh, threats of violence. And we, there's again, if you're interested in this area, um, there was a um, parlay caps is what they call them. Um, he made some very egregious threats against um, you know, professional football players, I think, including like Tom Brady. And, um, and so he was criminally convicted on those. But unfortunately, um, you know, my point here is that operators don't want to see these things either. <laughs> so, um, and, and I think that's my biggest concern is that um, operators of sports betting are going to be looked um, down upon for this ex continued expansion of sports betting and uh, the unfortunate circumstances that might come out of it, like the touts or the threats. Um, but we're not interested as operators and in that field uh, for having those things. We don't want to see uh, integrity issues. We don't want to see influences of, of 
um, score setting outcomes because we get hit by that. <laughs> um, yeah, that hits our revenue. Um, and I think that the, the point I want to make is that that's where states, as we're expanding, don't understand is that we're actually an ally in, in helping prevent those things. We, I report constantly to regulators if I see anything of concern that might affect integrity, that might affect, you know, you know, the fraudulent activity because regulators are our partners. Um, sports league are, leagues are our partners. We don't want to see uh, NFL team members betting on their own games because if they use a, you know, us as an operator, that means we're getting hit with inside information that could affect our bottom line. Um, and we want to prevent those things as well. And I think part of that message too comes down to these are not new issues. These issues have been around. The reason that you're hearing more about them is because we do have a more transparent system. It is more highly regulated. It is more um, visible. But death threats, um, touts, uh, you know, insider betting, all of that have taken place and still take place. Um, but they were all using what they call illegal methods. They were using apps that you can still download today uh, that are based in Antigua or in, you know, uh, Curacao or places that the Department of Justice can't access and we can't shut down. And that's the big issue in, in sports betting now and where we're, where operators are like begging the federal government um, to do something about these illegal operators because they do put a bad name on operators that want to operate legitimately and under um, strict regulation of like the bad thing. That's fine. So kind of to Brett's point, now, now that we provided the cautionary tale, uh, let's move on to some of the opportunities now we mentioned that. Opportunities in sports betting, whether it be with an operator, community, team, a league, et cetera. Would you repeat? I'm not sure. No, just start expanding. What what are the opportunities for various operators in the sports betting space? Teams, sports betting, sports teams, sports leagues, or even local communities when it comes to sports betting. I don't have the uh, legal answers, <laughs> but as you can see, as soon as this took place, everything opened up to the teams, the leagues, colleges, uh, everyone has now partnered with uh, a, an operator, a sports betting operator, uh, and, and the advertisement, I'm not sure how they're doing it right now, the money that they're spending on advertising, and the people that are partnering together, how they, at the end, I'm not sure how that's gonna come out, but it has certainly uh, given rise to partnerships um, that were never even considered before, wouldn't even be allowed. And now these people are allowed to uh, to go in and become the same partners that, that gaming is with the licensee. Uh, they can go in and, and, and hopefully they're doing the same thing on their side. It's not all about just sponsorship, but it's about protecting their product uh, at, at the highest level. And that's what uh, the good partnerships are going to do, I, I would feel like hope. One for Brett. And I, I mean, I know it's interesting too. We've seen recently that a lot, some of the partnerships that the sports betting companies have had with, with colleges, they a lot of those have recently um, pulled out for various reasons. Yeah, and I think that goes to, you know, you don't want your name associated with anything that gives it a negative image, right? And I know a lot of regulators have concerns about. Um, you know, the partnership of sports betting and colleges because there are individuals under 21 years of age at colleges. Um, but I think we'll see um, some of the advertising subside a little bit. Um, you know, it's always a class when you have something new and something shiny and, you know, you want to get your product out there in the market. And, um, you know, for my company, we were one of the first to say that's 
spending all those dollars on advertising doesn't do much. <laughs> so I think you'll still be a little bit of a subside. I think you'll see regulator pressure um, going against you know these kind of deals because of potential integrity issues. Even though you know I'd be more concerned about the businessman that's not regulated versus an operator that's regulated that could lose their license if they were discovered, um, you know, unduly influencing uh, a game, you know, so that's, but sometimes it's public perception that you want to preserve and, and, you know, operators will buy by the, you know, regulators' wishes and, um, you know, not, you know, and that's why you've seen those deals cancel. It's because it's more of an image than anything else. Yeah. yeah. So I, I cleaned out my couch recently and I discovered food stuffs that my niece had stuck between the cushions and that was really gross. And, and but I, I I opened it up, right? And instead of having these cushions sitting on top of my couch, I picked them up, I opened up the bottom of my couch to see what was there. And I also found plenty of coins that I had dropped behind. I don't bill that had somehow fallen into my couch. And so my, my thought process here is not just to tell you about what a mess maker my three-year-old niece is, but the idea that when you shine a light on something, you don't just get to see the negatives that are there. You also get to clean that up because you know it's present. And then you also get to see what other opportunities might arise there. When we know more about what's going on in sports and the betting associated with it, it's a lot easier to be able to do, for example, crazy spell rather than when we have something like, uh, and this is what I'm about to say, is true. Some people doubt this. My great uncle Bucky was a bookie on a street corner in Manhattan in the early 1900s. And you better believe that he was a cheating lines, you know, the, the, all of these to my great, 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 great grandmother. Uh, but but that's what he did. That was what it was to be a bookie in New York in the early 1900s. You had, if you wanted to make money and you had a slim or the 2% uh, uh, margin on whatever you were doing, or the less revenues, margin was thinner. I wanted to be much thinner than 2%. Uh, then you really had to make sure that you were sharp. You had to be able to offer bets where you were going to keep a bigger take as the bookmaker. And and so he did. He lied and cheated. I don't think he fixed any games, at least not that has been passed on from generation to generation. <laughs> but this is something that that is present. This is when, when we have a lot of this kind of illegal gambling going on, we don't necessarily know what that is then affecting. And I'm not saying that all legal gambling is perfect and above board, and we don't have too many advertisements. Of course not. I want to see, and I'm going to pick on that MGM here because I can't. I, I want to see Jamie Foxx walk across the Bellagio fountains over and over and over again because this is that a fantastic commercial. Clearly, there's a lot of issues that that we are working through now, and I'm so scared to insult to Samson. I didn't catch your name. Philip. Philip. Yeah. I, I'm so going to guess the wrong accent here. <laughs> yes, because yeah. I also have something positive to say about New Zealand. But Australia <laughs> is a fantastic example of the kind of trajectory that jurisdictions may go down with regard to sports betting. Sports betting is ever present in sport in Australia. The advertisements show up everywhere. They're blazing across jerseys. They show up on the sidelines at games. Uh, it, it's the, the odds in the same way that we see it now in, in some of the games here in North America constantly talked about by broadcasters in, in Australia. And clearly there's a moment at which we, we just go too far. Now for different people, too far is a different line. But that is something that once we are in a place where we can figure it out, that's when we can actually figure out what that line might be. What is something that we want to do? And Again, we're in, a, in North America, that's something we're still figuring out. And we, we actually have the luxury now of following. I once heard somebody say that we're leading from behind, which I thought was so apt for what we're doing here, because uh, a lot of Europe, a lot of Australia and New Zealand is far ahead of what's going on in Canada and the United States with regard to trajectory on 
What's an appropriate amount of advertising? What sort of promotions should be offered? What sort of relationships should different organizations have, like Jennifer mentioned, the sports organizations, the regulators, the betting operators, to ensure that integrity flags are put up at the right moments? And then I also did want to specifically call out New Zealand. It's a really interesting place uh, in that the federations, the national sporting federations in New Zealand, actually receive revenues from the gambling that's done on their sport. So not necessarily like partnership, but for example, let's say that I play rugby, uh, which I don't, but I was. Um, and so if, if somebody places a bet on rugby, a percentage of the revenues from my bet go towards the National Rugby Association of New Zealand. And that's the way it's set up for every sporting federation in that country. And it, it's not one I've seen repeated in any other countries, but I've always thought that was really fascinating because it really helps with the concept of ensuring that funds are available not just for the success of sport as a whole, but also for the protection of sport while betting exists all around it. Fantastic. I was really hoping there was going to be, uh, I took the $5 and placed it on, the, on Denver and Las Vegas for the second championship plan. I'm going to watch this. My idiot husband waiting for the odds was terrible. It was really nice. <laughs> oh, okay. I do that. But it was a, a, a great uh, analogy. Right there. So, I, moving on to the topic of integrity, which has kind of been brushed upon here a little bit. And the panel des described some of what of the current approach to maintaining sport integrity and then regulation as well. So, <laughs> the integrity issue uh, was attacked almost immediately by uh, companies who were sitting and waiting for that particular deal. Uh, U.S. integrity, here is the data, it started and they joined with other companies. Uh, obviously, the NCAA has been doing studies for years, uh, but there are more companies now monitoring every single aspect of a sporting, sporting event than, than it's ever been. And the slightest thing, and this goes back to the partnership thing, U.S. Integrity would immediately reach out to the likes of seeds saying, we got this information. Have you seen any wagers that would, that would pertain to this type of information and how did it affect uh, the line or how did it affect the actual game outcome? So these companies that are out there monitoring every, it's incredible. I mean, I think COVID probably taught us that sports doesn't stop. The rest of the world stopped. COVID showed us cricket, ping pong, Korean, uh, Korean volleyball, whatever it might have been, people, the people who need to bet, they have someplace to go. And these companies have the ability to monitor that, that entire spectrum of sports and the entire spectrum of the, the wagers being made and the licensees. Uh, and obviously these people are hired by the licensees or the operators to, to monitor this. Well, they're customers, you know, those are customers of the integrity units, but they've been doing a, a stellar job, I believe, in, in monitoring and pointing out and reaching out to the leagues, to the operators, to the regulators, to the enforcers, uh, information that may in fact uh, be some type of violation of whether it's law or regulation or, or just a scandal with the sport. And the way operators kind of look for integrity issues are we're going to look at how much money is coming in on and on games. Is it unusual amount? You know, is it someone betting on uh, an underdog that no one would really pick? You know, a lot of money coming in, that's going to raise red flags. You know, maybe there's someone that's trying to influence the outcome or would, you know, um, that would affect the bet. Uh, you know, a lot of wagers, um, whether there's going to be not only on, you know, underdogs, but just on one side of an event. A lot of information coming in about, you know, um, who's wagering, you know, are, are a lot of sharp betters going on one side. You know, you're going to, you're going to be looking at, all sorts of information about the betting activity to see whether you see something unusual. You're going to also look at the activity of your competitors. 
you know, uh, there's there's resources out there, but you can see the lines, um, uh, the prices, the odds uh, of all of your competitors, so that you know, are they showing a big fluctuation in bets? Um, and making line movement um, changes. I know that sounds kind of getting into the weeds, but you want to know whether you're, uh, you know, um, you want to see whether they're seeing action on um, a certain side. Um, so those things you monitor, and if you see something very unusual, then you work with your uh, integrity providers. You work with your regulators. Say, hey, this this doesn't look right. Um, you know, or we saw this large bet on this underdog, and it's very unusual based upon the patron betting behavior. So those are things that you look for, and you do report it because, again, you don't want people like that that out there that could eventually hit your bottom line. But you also don't want people like that in the industry, um, and you want you know Creighton the, the world to take action um, to prevent you know further activity like that. So. Absolutely. I think the important thing is there's nothing wrong with being good at sports. Club. There are people out there that are very above board who are just smarter than most operators. But to Jennifer's point, it's the ones that are getting either inside information. There's some sort of integrity issue. Those are the ones that we always as operators want to make sure that we're not following proper protocols, only to enforce the provisions for that. I'll really put that though. Is this go to 430? Uh, 10 past. 410. Okay. Oh, I was to add one more thing that's been inspired by what Jennifer said twice here. And I just want to describe the different fluctuations in wagers and what, what one might look for. And then also, since Jennifer is making uh, TV recommendations, I'll also recommend there's an early episode of CSI in the Supreme Court uh, called Big Middle, which uh, actually, does, in my opinion, does a pretty good job of. Explaining the, the shifting of lines. Hmm? Yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, it is. That's the clear, the clear way. This is the, the point of the episode. It's not a solved crime, but, uh, but it talks about how lines move at a sports book and how different wagers on different sides of the bet or sort of the volume of the wager that's placed can shift the line out of walk and create what's called the big middle, uh, which is the name of the episode. So I wanted to give away the punchline. <laughs> But see, I, I do encourage that episode actually as a, a pretty, like a really nice pop culture way of learning more about uh, how lines work. Yeah, it's always going in my <laughs> Write down the name Spencer Cornelia. If you've never heard the name, um, go on YouTube. Uh, Spencer Cornelia is, is, lives here in Vegas, and he will learn sports betting pretty quickly <laughs> listening to him. He, 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 what he did originally was he would do YouTube, YouTube videos on financial folks to show that they were scammers. He then switched over to touts and showed how they were scamming. Uh, this is with the Mercedes Benz and the Lamborghini. And then he went to, he spent two days with a, uh, a tariff better up in Colorado. And that will really give you a good idea of uh, how sports betting changed. With the various states coming on board, um, it's a, it's a very educational, about twenty three minute video. Watch it right through. You're gonna have to stop a few times here and there, ask yourself some questions. But the information he gives you on sports betting and the sharp sports better and what they have to do to survive, um, you will learn quite a bit in the sports betting world. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so I definitely want to make some time for questions from the audience. Before that, I'd like to touch on at least one specific instance of compromising. We've seen a few of these instances over the previous uh, few years. And one of the most recent ones that comes to mind was involving uh, Alabama baseball, the college team, where the coach was relieved of duties after it was found that he was actually on the phone with a former high school coach who was making large wagers against his team after receiving some inside information from a coach. So I wanted to ask you. What were your thoughts when you saw this? And how do you feel this was handled by regulators and operators? Good question. 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 Good uh, where clearly 
you know, we, being in this room, we can't see if you just implicitly say, why would you do that? That is against the rules. It's not just against the rules of NCAA, it's also against the state rules. You can't have somebody placing these wagers on your behalf. Um, Nevada has an entire, I'm afraid to talk about this one, but Nevada has an entire system for registering a proxy to even allow that so that they know it's all about KYC, know your customer to ensure that the operator knows who is placing this wager and that the regulator then can also have that information provided. Uh, but the fun concept part of that is that this won't be completely off in some areas. Uh, so, for example, in um, in Iran, they have uh, horse racing, they have camel racing, and the, uh, the general public is not permitted to place wagers. Uh, a lot of it is in the law that exists in some of these places, and gambling is not like, one of the things that's not permitted there. But interestingly, the jockeys are permitted to bet. So people will give the jockeys their bets to place on the race they're about to race in. And so that's another fun concept where you have a very odd gambling setup where the law may be thinking about the consequences of the law, which happens all the time in our world, right? That's uh, but within this scope, then I'll go back to the scope. Just want to share fun facts here. Um, is that this is clearly a mistake with regard to the regulatory response? I think it's a it, it, you know, clearly this is the kind of thing that we in some ways want to happen. If somebody is a bad actor, it's a good thing for them to be caught. And it's a good thing for that to be a public response and have that bad actor uh, put into the public eye because it's a demonstration to those to other bad actors who may be out there. Uh, it's not just that the consequences of the thing, but I, and here we'll get into opinions since I'm afraid to open the door for this that I saw your opinion on. Uh, which is that um, I, I, I think there's a lot of ignorance over malice that exists as something like sports betting grows. In a place that's much more mature, like Australia, like Europe, like Nevada, you have less of an excuse to say this sort of thing. But very much as this grows, we have a lot of this knowledge gap to overcome. And I think that we're going to see a lot more instances of this as we move forward with uh, regulation of sports betting space. I think part of the, the problem is arrogance. People don't think that they're that's, that's not true. 25 years ago in Las Vegas, there wasn't much you could do that wasn't on video. That is now the world. There's a camera in every person's hand when you walk by down the street. So the thing that you thought you could, the neighbor's car that you wanted to scratch, Whatever it might be, something you want to do that you didn't think was going to be video is now being video. So conversations, uh, things taking place in, in areas that you think are not public, all those things are now, the world is now Las Vegas. It's become some video. It, it's everywhere. And it's going to continue to be everywhere. And, and hopefully the education portion of this is, is the outcome. And I haven't seen the outcome on that yet. Um, people will learn. That you know you're you're going to be found out. It's simple as that. If, if it's something that's uh, you know the NFL player who's gambling as well, uh, he's he's going to have some issues. I don't see what his final outcome is going to be. But these people, based on all the partnerships you talked about, the integrity, the operator, the gambler, everybody wants to keep things uh, as level a playing field as they can. So people like that. Are going to be, they're going to be brought out, they're going to be pointed out, and they're going to be uh, hopefully it's going to belong to the guy on his property. <laughs> yeah, this goes back to the operator's standpoint. If the regulator in Ohio was waiting for place, they sent out letters to operators immediately informing them of what happened. They basically said, you know, from here on out, you know, until this investigation is complete, they remove wagers on, on Alabama. And that's what most operators end up doing. They just said, all right, for the rest of the season, we can't. No wagers on Alabama. All right, well, we did four cars. We got 10 minutes left. I want to leave some time for some uh, for some QA. There's some uh, pretty interesting topics here. So uh, thank you. Um so the um the theme of this um conference is the impact of on professional sport on community. And um also we see obviously there are um 
the massive effects that sports betting can have on the community, especially uh, the health of the community. And um, we know that gambling addiction um, is can be in a, a first game that can affect um, different communities. Um, how do we grapple that along with the constant exposure of, um, of gambling sites? Um, you go see a game on your local team or uh, watching, you're trying to watch your local team and there'd be about two or three gambling commercials within that one commercial break. And with the constant influence, um, um, not only um, is that exposure um, spreading around um, those communities, especially those who are um, young and impressionable, but it's also um, affecting the athletes as well. Um, there, you know, we have players, you know, um, wearing shirts that have sponsors, gambling sponsors, and then to see there, it seems like they're the ones who are most at risk um, to falling into those, um, falling into the dangers of gambling, and the and the one, and they're the, also the ones who are being punished um, more for it. Um, so. How do we um, um, combat the, how do we um, from prioritize the health of our community um, with the increased exposure of sports betting? I'm, I'm going to say essentially to you because I know nothing about the health aspect of it, but in my opinion, and I think the National Council does a great, it's all about education, it's all about preparing people for the positions they're going to be in, whether it's an athlete, uh, whether it's a gambler, whether it's a coach. NCAA for years has done uh, seminars, training, teaching, surveys, NFL, all the major sports have done the same thing. Uh, they bring the players in, uh, work the players annually. Uh, they have these kind of conferences. So the education and simplest old guy terms, education for me is the answer to to getting moving that forward. Now the real answer is when we hear it in some of the Perfect practice. Uh, it's not a solved problem. I can tell you that for sure. Anybody who says they have a complete answer is, is wrong. Um, I, I, I'm not gonna say they're lying outside, but but they're 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 not perfect. It's an ongoing grapple that we have in, in the betting world, in the gambling research world. Um, about 90% of researchers in our space study harm and harm prevention and how that exists within With betting, one of the things that has continued to come up is it's almost like a novelty type effect when something new and fresh is out. There's a ton of interest, a ton of money is being spent on advertising. There are a lot of betting companies right now that are not actually making money at the moment because they're putting so much money into customer acquisition. Clearly, that's not sustainable from a business standpoint, and clearly that's not sustainable from a public health standpoint. As you specifically described, there's multiple advertisements going on. Um, there was a point, if you, if you look back to 2015, when we hadn't yet had the proliferation of sports betting in North America that we have now, that you win fantasy sports were particularly prevalent. There was a daily fantasy sport advertising on TV every two and a half minutes. Not like just during sports, just in bed, there was uh, every two and a half minutes. It was, it was nuts, frankly, all the time this was going on. Um, and and uh, it's good that it was from the state of Nevada because the state of Nevada considers this to be a gambling activity that requires licensure. Uh, so I can be frank about that as well. But this is something that's ever present. Education is a huge part of it that ties into everything, not just education of players and reps and teams and uh, anyone else who might be a stakeholder, but the general public. There's a lot of public health efforts around this. There are different tools, usually the, the term we use is responsible gambling in order to responsible drinking, that sort of thing. So for example, if you use WinDeck, there will be a number of different tools that are available. They can help you set a budget. They can help you set limits within that budget. So once I spend a hundred dollars, I'm not for the month. Uh, you, it, the site won't let me place a bet for the rest of the month until the last resets. Uh, you can set timeouts for yourself. 
Um, I need to take a two-month break. These are all wonderful tools, but they're just that. They're tools. They're incredibly helpful in certain situations. They're not perfect for everybody. Not everybody needs them necessarily, right? So I, I budget myself, so I don't use a tool like that. Uh, these are all things that are more on the prevention side. When we get into the treatment side of things, then that grows exponentially. Because then we're talking about much bigger, broader issues. Uh, one of the things that when we look at this space is how different sports betting is from other types of injury. Uh, when we talk about, these are very generic terms that I've used here. So there's the concept of escape gambling. So this is usually gambling in which you don't have to make an active decision. So for example, slot machine where you just put your feet clicking the button or sell you pull the handle. Yes, the handle pulled at you. And you have to look for a slot machine now that has all the things. And then the other side of that is action. And that's something like sports betting. You're making active decisions in what you're doing. Blackjack, where you may be, for example, playing basic strategy. Poker is another example. And these manifest in different ways when it comes to problem gambling. And so they require different types of treatment, different elements that come into play. And then that cycles back into the prevention stage. These different prevention things, one of the big things that I've long been an advocate for, in fact, earlier today, I was working on a talk that I'm putting later this year, on how do we even do this messaging right? We've been through tons of iterations. Uh, I'll, I'll just thank you for being here from Australia because it gives me a great person to think of people to point to uh, with examples. But this is something that's constantly being researched and studied in Australia. And there are things that we are pretty sure work, things like these sorts of, uh, for example, budgeting tools or, or time prevention tools. Uh, the ability to uh, opt out of marketing emails, for example, that sort of thing, so it might not be a trigger. But then we get into the bigger, broader things. If I'm constantly seeing an advertisement about my favorite athlete's teacher, is that going to be a trigger? Uh, and how many people does that affect? So my 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 answer for you is from, from a very neutral place. There's a lot that we now know that we didn't know even five years ago in terms of harm prevention. But there's still so much more to figure out when it comes to how human beings deal with too much risk. And I know the Michigan Gaming Control Board even has put out a recommendation that high school um, high schoolers be taught gambling and gambling risk, not not how to get. <laughs> 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 And and I think the one benefit of having regulated transparent gambling is that it also opens up the transparency of the resources that are out there to help um, those that might have a problem. And one of the things that I always throw out there and say, because we, you know, we're an academic institution, we are a neutral zone. We don't go out there and advocate for gambling. We don't go out there and advocate for bans on gambling. We research what this thing is. Uh, and so we get a lot of groups who come to us with questions. You know, I want to learn more about this. And one of the things that I, we always put into these sorts of, of lesson moments and research moments is that gambling is not right for every person. It's not right for every organization. It might be. It might be a perfect partnership for some sort of sporting organization. Uh, it might work well for a relationship that has multi prongs, for example, an integrity reporting uh, wheel. But it might not be right for your sporting organization. And, if, and when that's the case, that's the case. Right now, we're seeing the backlash on that. We already talked about it, right? The pullback of partnership between uh, universities and betting organizations. Uh, LSU had that very famous, I don't know, scandal, though. I don't know if it fits all the way to say it was 1919, the White Sox. Uh, but the, the sending out uh, recruitment emails for sign up forms for a sports book that they had partnered with. And now that deal is one of the ones that has now been pulled back. So part of this is a learning experience. Um, some of it is, you know, please, right? Like, talk to us, right? You know, it's, talk to any of us <laughs> uh, as, as you see this in your communities, if it's something that you have questions about as it relates to the sporting organization that you love. Uh, because this is something that's a very complex issue. There are no simple solutions to problems, and there's no simple, big, major opportunity that everybody can capitalize on.
Yeah, I, I, my, I have a question about the fundamental terms yes. used about the bidding. And uh, as the uh, lawyers uh, uh, spoke about Michigan gaming, oh, yeah. the gaming committee or something. Now, is really bidding a game? Okay. Or shouldn't, uh, if we have uh, an integrity committee at, at, at any level, should they be fighting against using terms like such as game? Because there is no play involved in gambling, uh, betting. Shouldn't that be pitched as a business rather than uh, uh, a game? Well, I think, I mean, I think historically it's been pitched as a business, but I think and categorized as gambling because, you know, but if you're really talking about placing bets on um, the skill outcome of others, it's booking. Are you referring to the nomenclature of using the term gaming? Yes. Gambling? Oh, I think we yeah. refer to it as a game of chance. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the question. And as yeah. a game, well, Games usually have no serious consequences. It's supposed to be, if you play, you're not uh, supposed to get to serious consequences. But it looks like in all betting, in all gambling, there, really, there are serious consequences. Then shouldn't, at the federal level or state level, people be fighting against this term, use misuse of the terms? I'm so glad you asked this question. So first, and this is why I just want to get that down. Not all gambling has negative consequences to it, but it can. Uh, the, the term gaming is the result of a probably decade long discursive shift that started in the late 80s, early 90s, when the term gambling carried with it a ton of stigma, casino carried with it a ton of stigma, especially in North America. Um, we had just here in this state, we were only maybe 10 years out of getting rid of the law. Uh, that ran everything. Oh, another recommendation, watch the video to see more. <laughs> uh, and, and so this was something that, that came out of that. So gambling shifted. First it went to gambling entertainment, and then gaming entertainment, and then more briefly, gaming. In the end, gambling games are games. They're a subset of games. They're, they're games of chance, for example. Some games have more chance involved than others. And in, a, in many ways, the risks that we take in everyday life are, in essence, gambles. They're just gambles by another name. For example, uh, me driving in the rain in Las Vegas where nobody knows how to drive. <laughs> and that, that's sort of a, an off the cuff type of example. But that's what, when we use this term, it's a very broad term that has a lot of historical weight on it over the past few decades. In the gambling research field, it's something that is now shifting back to its original form of gambling, be more specific about what this chance is and using money to place wagers. So this is something where you're, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head right at another major moment of change for the academic field as well as the industry itself. In 2012, the Australian Crime Commission said that the biggest form of gambling is in the illegal market and constitutes 75% of global gambling. About 40 years ago, the second most modern man in South Asia, Toto Regardless, lived eventually in an Australian city where he lived for seven years and tried to turn it over to Vita, illegal gambling in cricket. Now, this is the biggest form of the gambling market. Talked about the official gambling market, what is being done in Nevada about the unofficial market, which is now when gamblers move to an official market in Australia, they go into the unofficial market with dire consequences. This is the case in America. <laughs> <laughs> Easy one. <laughs> So people, so the, the legal sports betting has always been, the illegal sports betting has always been. That, that has not changed because other states are now getting sports betting. People who, who the sharp betters, the best betters, 
they want to have as many different places to place a wager as they can. So if they can get online and see 30 different sports books numbers, legal, illegal, whatever, that's what they want. But they're looking for that one number that sticks out from the other 29. Now, we have investigated on a continual basis uh, illegal bookmaking, unlicensed sports books, uh, for whatever reason, there are times when that is not a priority, federally or local. Things are more important than uh, an illegal bookmaker uh, in the court system. And, and prosecution at times is difficult. Doesn't mean that we're not. We don't stop doing what we're doing. Uh, we continually investigate as much of this as we can. And occasionally uh, we get lucky. And by that, I mean we find a prosecutor who's interested in the end result. But it has not, the legalization in all these other states has not affected visually illegal versus legal here for that. That makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think yeah. you, your point, I think it's just really difficult when you look at this really the advent of technology, people using VPNs and going on these sites. And, and really just finding that that one person who might be betting on one of these what we call paperhead sites where they can use you know cryptocurrency and they can bet on credit and things like that. It is really difficult to isolate and to find each of these individuals as opposed to some large nebulous network that's really running these. Right. I know we're running out. Maybe one more question, and then I, I know I'll be talking to you more. I just have a quick. Well, maybe it's not a quick one. I think this might have been your question. Okay, so I'm on a betting app. If I were, I'm not. But if I were, a regulated, a regulated betting app. And a, so, yep, okay. right. Not in Antigua. Um, <laughs> and you, they give you a free. They give you free bets. Sure. Why are they doing that? And if the margin is so thin, is it to get you booked? And is yes. that so the problem? I mean, it wants loyalty oh, more than this. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, and, and Brett, Brett used the term acquisition earlier, and these are the very nascent early markets. Though. So just, I mean, it's a very common business to see where, you know, it's all about acquisition. And so the really deep pocket companies, what they'll do is they're, they're willing to spend to really just isolate and get that market share and drive out smaller operators and this is one of the biggest problems with the small operators is you hear this all the time everybody says it. we can't compete with jackets we can't compete with candle and what they're doing you know thousand dollars to sign up or five hundred dollars to sign up so the short of it is um as far as any sort of you know nefarious means behind it it really is just at the end of the day of acquisition yeah and at this actually the regulators have prohibited operators from using free bets. So we're not, no operator is allowed to use the term free bet or risk free bet um, because it isn't in that you you don't like to sign up and they give you $500 in cash to, to wager. There's, there are terms that go along with it. Like you place a wager and then you get a bet credit or, you know, there's different terms that are used. So, so the regulators have come out and said, hey, industry, you know, you be more transparent in, in what your offers are. But that's what it is. It's an offer. It's an incentive, you know, to incentivize people to come to your app or purchase of the competitor's app. It's a marketing tool. So. Makes sense. <laughs> Well, I know we've gone a little bit over. I think speaker the panelists, we do appreciate the engagement and the great questions from everybody. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Oh, so Michael left his laptop over there. Did you see his email? I think it was the one that we saw outside yesterday. Yeah, and, and so we have to, he's at our hotel. So I said we'd just take it back for him. I, we have to pack up the banner and stuff.
Oh, we have to. Yeah, we can't leave it. We can't leave anything. Yeah. 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 Yeah.